Hey, 42 here. Mission Control, we have liftoff. On the 13th of April 1970, three astronauts were broadcasting back to Earth, beaming a rare, live look inside a spaceship on one of the most important missions in history. Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert and Fred Hayes were heading for the moon where, if all went to plan, Lovell and Hayes would become the fifth and sixth humans to walk on its surface. All three men were in high spirits, chuckling and chortling for the camera, even playing practical jokes on one another. Back on Earth at Mission Control in Houston, Texas, the mood was equally buoyant. The first 55 hours had gone so smoothly that capsule communicator Joe Kerwin carped that he and the rest of the team were bored to tears. In hindsight, tempting fate with practical jokes and talk of boredom was a bad idea. Because if there's one place you don't want to dare the universe to make an example of you, it's in a tiny spaceship 200,000 miles from home. Lovell closed the broadcast by wishing the people of Earth a pleasant evening, sporting a beaming grin on his face. This is the crew of Apollo 13, wishing everybody there a nice evening. However, it didn't stay there for long. Okay, we've had a problem here. Because shortly after, Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes were fighting for their lives in a crippled spaceship that seemed certain to become their cold, cramped coffin. The question on their and everyone else's lips was simple. Would they make it home alive? This is the remarkable story of the most magnificent mishap in the history of spaceflight. This is Apollo 13. Let me ask, do you ever feel like everyone else is getting better deals than you? Then you need to start using Honey. Honey is the number one shopping tool in America, with over 100,000 five-star Google reviews. It automatically searches for promo codes on lots of your favorite websites, so you don't have to. Just imagine shopping online and having your very own savings sidekick finding you discounts of 18% on average. Well, that's Honey. It's just a little button at the top of your browser that's always ready to help you save money. So how does it work? Well, it's super simple. First, you need to add the Honey extension to your browser. Then you just shop online like you usually would. When you reach the checkout page, Honey will automatically pop up and search for any available promo codes and automatically apply the best saving possible to your basket. And the best part is Honey works for things you're already buying on lots of sites you're already shopping on. So it's not like you have to change anything, you'll just end up spending less. So what are you waiting for? Add Honey to your browser for free at joinhoney.com 42. Make sure you use that link, joinhoney.com 42, to support this channel. And a big thanks to Honey for sponsoring this video. It's easy to assume that the eyes of the world were on the crew of Apollo 13 as they blasted off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, but the truth is, most people didn't even know the launch was happening. Apollo 13 was to be the fifth manned mission to the moon, and its astronauts would be the third crew to step foot on its surface. What would be huge news today was old news back in 1970. As a result, that broadcast I just mentioned, the one that should have given the public an incredible insight into the life of a space shuttle heading to the moon, yeah, not a single station picked it up, and it was never actually shown on TV. If it had been, those who watched would have witnessed the stillness before space exploration's most severe storm because within six and a half minutes of the Apollo 13 crew waving goodbye to an absent audience, a large chunk of their spacecraft exploded. A loud bang bellowed and scores of warning lights simultaneously blinked on. It was Jack Swigert who first reported the bad news to Mission Control in what is now one of the most famous quotes in history. Houston, we have a problem. Except that isn't actually what he said. Swigert's actual proclamation was the pronouncedly less piffy. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. The misquote was made famous by the 1995 film Apollo 13, but it wasn't so much a mistake as a deliberate rewriting of history. 
The modified line, particularly the change from past to present tense, was deemed more dramatic. Anyway, the exact wording doesn't matter. What mattered was that the crew of Apollo 13 were now officially fucked. So many of the spaceship systems went south so swiftly that the guys in Mission Control assumed their instruments were playing up. Jim Lovell had another theory. He thought they'd been hit by a meteor. As it happens, they were both wrong. A faulty wire had caused an explosion that destroyed the ship's vital oxygen tanks. Short of the insta-death of a decompression incident, it was just about the worst possible thing that could happen. It wasn't just that the crew needed oxygen for, you know, not dying. The ship did too. The Apollo 13 command module, which housed the crew's accommodation and many of the ship's critical systems, was powered by free electrochemical fuel cells, and the cells themselves were fed by a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. No oxygen meant no electricity, and no electricity meant almost nothing in the entire command module would work. Before the explosion, the Apollo 13 crew had been speeding towards the moon and a place in history. After it, they were scrambling simply to survive. The first and most pressing obstacle to overcome was the minor concern that the oxygen was about to run out. The Apollo 13 spacecraft was split into three parts. The command module, the service module and the lunar module. Without power, the command module was essentially dead and the service module, which housed the recently exploded oxygen tanks and other consumables, contained no living space. That left the lunar module, the craft that would have taken Lovell and Hayes down to the surface of the moon had the mission not gone to absolute shite. The lunar lander was a tight fit for free grown men and it hadn't been designed for prolonged occupation. It didn't even have seats and in places its outer shell was less than a millimeter thick. That was the bad news, but the good news was life-saving. The lunar module was essentially a self-contained unit. It had its own life support system and was powered by dedicated batteries. With oxygen and therefore power rapidly depleting in the command module, the astronauts made a mad dash for the lunar module. Swigert stayed behind to shut down the sundry electrical systems to save what little power was left. They were going to need it if they ever made it back to Earth whilst Lovell got to work transferring vital navigational data from the computer in the command module to the one in the lunar module. Unfortunately for Lovell, the computers used different coordinate systems, so he was forced to do some on-the-fly algebra to convert between the two. Considering any errors would likely have meant death for him and his friends, it was a bit like doing an undergraduate mathematics exam whilst the universe held a gun to his temple. Luckily, Lovell was an absolute badass and he passed with flying colours. For the next three and a half days, the lunar module would become the astronaut's lifeboat in the sea of space. A tiny oasis in the deadliest desert in the universe. But whilst the immediate, oh shit, we're all about to die danger had passed, there was still a small matter of how the hell they were going to get home. Remember, at this point, they were still speeding away from Earth towards the moon. The most obvious course of action was to fire the main thruster to turn the ship around. It was the fastest way to get home, but it was also risky. It would mean draining most of the remaining power from the command module's fuel cells, and even worse, the thruster was located on the recently exploded service module. Neither the crew nor mission control had any way of knowing whether it had been damaged in the blast. In a worst case scenario, firing it could have blown the entire ship into a million pieces. That was far from ideal, so NASA's best and brightest came up with a radical plan B. You see, the service module wasn't the only part of the ship equipped with a thruster. The lunar module had one too, designed to control the lander's descent down to the surface of the moon. It was significantly less powerful than the main thruster, so an immediate UE wasn't possible. But it did have enough power to nudge the ship's course just enough to put it on an Earth re-entry trajectory after slingshotting around the moon. It would be much slower than an immediate abort using the main thruster, but it was also significantly safer. 
The decision ultimately lay with flight director Gene Kranz, and after careful consideration, he placed his bet on the tortoise rather than the hare. As Apollo 13 swung around the far side of the moon, the crew performed a 34-second burn of the lunar module's descent propulsion system to put the craft back on a re-entry trajectory, followed by a second longer burn to speed up the journey home by about 12 hours. That last part was crucial because time was most certainly of the essence. Plan B may have avoided the possible game over screen of firing the potentially damaged main thruster, but it came with grave dangers of its own. The lunar module was designed to accommodate two astronauts on the surface of the moon for about two days. But after its entirely unexpected career change from lunar lander to long-term lifeboat, it was going to have to support three astronauts for three and a half days. You don't have to be Pythagoras to see that those sums don't add up and every single consumable resource, energy, food, water, and oxygen would have to be stretched to the absolute limit if the crew were to stand any chance of returning to terra firma. The lunar module had its own batteries, but they'd never been intended for such prolonged use. If they died, so too would the crew. So, all non-essential systems were shut down, reducing energy consumption to about one-fifth of its typical rate. The problem was, the ship's electrical systems also happened to be an important source of passive heat. With most of them powered down, the temperature inside the ship plummeted to just 3 degrees Celsius, about what you'd find in a fridge. For the most part, food wasn't an issue. The crew still had access to the crippled command module, where there was plenty of grub floating around, literally, although some of it had froze. Water, however, was a different story. There was a small potable reserve on board, but most of the water was supposed to be made along the way as a byproduct of reactions in the ship's fuel cells. You know, the broken ones. And many of the ship's critical systems relied on water cooling. So, in an effort to make sure there was enough of the wet stuff for both man and machine, the astronauts were put on a water ration of just 200 milliliters per person per day. Surprisingly, oxygen wasn't actually a concern. Despite being designed for a two-day stay on the moon, the lunar module had contingency built in, which included a large quantity of excess oxygen. Unfortunately, the crew also had an excess of something much less desirable. About a day and a half after relocating into the lunar module, yet another warning light started to blink. The carbon dioxide level was getting dangerously high. The lunar module was equipped with a CO2 filtration system. But like everything else, it hadn't been designed for such prolonged and intensive use. The system relied on canisters of CO2 scrubbing, lithium hydroxide pellets, but they could only absorb so much before becoming saturated. Luckily, there were plenty of spare canisters in the command module. Unfucking luckily, they were square shaped and incompatible with the round filter housing in the lunar module. In hindsight, that was a huge oversight. There was no reason whatsoever for the canisters to be incompatible across the two modules. But it was far too late for finger pointing. If they didn't find a solution fast, Lovell, Swigert and Hayes were dead men walking. It was a life or death situation, but it was also kind of hard not to appreciate the irony of NASA being forced to focus the combined brain power of its most brilliant engineers on the age-old problem of trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The solution they came up with was suitably ingenious, limited only by what would be available to the astronauts. They hashed out a design for a filter adapter using a spacesuit hose, several plastic sample bags, cardboard torn from logbook covers, and a rolled up sock. This ridiculous contraption was held together with duct tape and looked about as sophisticated as a crackhead in drag. But, as soon as the astronauts finished putting it together, the CO2 levels began to drop. Despite having once again successfully managed to not die, things were going from bad to worse. The crew were forbidden from venting urine out into space for fear the tiny jets of wee would propel the craft off course. And after several days peeing in plastic bags, there were pouches of piss all over the place. 
In summary, Lovell, Swigert and Hayes were cold, they were dehydrated, and they were perpetually assaulted by plastic pockets of their own piss. But if Lovell and his crew thought their luck was about to change, they were mistaken. Because as Earth grew ever larger outside the spacecraft's windows, Mission Control got in touch with yet more bad news. They drifted off course. Instead of penetrating Earth's atmosphere as intended, they were going to bounce off it like a skimming stone. If that happened, there would be no second chances. The spaceship would become their tomb and their frozen corpses would remain in a loose orbit around Earth for thousands, perhaps millions of years. Now, I know what you're thinking, they'd already corrected their course once, why not just do it again? Unfortunately, it wasn't that easy. The previous course correction had leveraged the moon's gravity in tandem with the thrusters. This time, so close to Earth and without the moon's gravity to help out, they were going to have to take matters into their own hands. Literally. With the guidance computer powered down, the ship's location and orientation was uncertain. They grabbed hold of the controls and, using the sun as a reference point, manually lined the ship up for re-entry. This was entirely uncharted territory. No crew had ever attempted anything like it before. Get it wrong, and they would be dead. Get it right, and, well, they still might be dead, but at least they'd have a chance. Five hours before scheduled re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, Mission Control gave them the go-ahead to execute the burn. Under unimaginable pressure, Lovell, Swigert and Hayes pulled off this unprecedented manoeuvre perfectly. So perfectly, in fact, that by the time they shut off the thrusters, they were within half a degree of their intended angle of approach. Apollo 13 was coming home. The lunar module had served the astronauts remarkably well over the past three and a half days, but the time had come to leave it behind because only one part of the Apollo spacecraft was capable of withstanding the enormous temperatures of re-entry, the command module. There was of course one slight problem with that, the crippled command module had been powered down three and a half days earlier. Engineers on the ground had spent the intervening time trying to figure out how the hell they were going to bring it back online again using only the lunar module's meagre battery. Nobody had ever powered down a command module in space before, and the team had to write an entirely new procedure from scratch. It ran to over 500 individual steps, and it was down to the absolutely bloody knackered, dangerously dehydrated Jack Swigert to implement it in the freezing cold command module with only torchlight to see by. Oh, and just in case that wasn't miserable enough, any mistake meant certain death. To the immense relief of everyone concerned, Swigert swaggered his way through the makeshift process and the wounded command module slowly flickered back into life. With that out of the way, the service and lunar modules were jettisoned off into space and Apollo 13 was ready for re-entry. Even then, having come so far and gone through so much, nobody knew for sure if they'd make it down to Earth in one piece. The key concern was the heat shield. It had been perilously close to the site of the oxygen tank explosion, and there was no way of knowing if it had been damaged in the blast. If the heat shield failed, the astronauts would die a fiery death. That was surely on their minds as they shut themselves in and prepared for the lights to go up on the final act of the most extraordinary space opera in history. Would they see their families again, or were they seconds from an agonizing death? they were about to find out. Back on Earth, Apollo 13 had gone from a mission nobody cared about to the most closely followed in history after the Apollo 11 moon landing. There had been round-the-clock news coverage of the astronaut's plight, and an estimated 70 million people were watching events unfold on TV. Many millions more had their eyes trained on the sky. Just to ratchet up the tension that little bit further, there would be a four minute radio blackout during re-entry as the immense heat interrupted comms. The world held its breath as the seconds ticked down. And when those four minutes were finally up, Houston tentatively radioed the command module and got no response. <laughs> 
whatsoever. A full minute and a half passed and still, there was nothing. But just when it seemed certain the Apollo astronauts perished at the very last hurdle, Jack Swigert's voice crackled into life on the radio. Apollo 13 had made it. The command module splashed down in the South Pacific soon afterwards, not far from American Samoa, where the crew were picked up by the USS Iowa Jima. They were cold, they were dehydrated, they were tired, and they were very, very, very glad to be home. Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes may not have walked on the surface of the moon, but to this day, they hold the record for reaching the greatest distance from Earth in history. To put that another way, no human beings before or since have ventured further away from our home planet than the Apollo 13 astronauts. Even more importantly, those three men played the starring roles in one of mankind's greatest triumphs of cooperation and survival. Thanks for watching.